Hi, I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Hello, everyone. You are watching For the Greater Good with your host, Evelyn Richardson. And today, my special guest is our Honorable Mayor Pedro Segarra. I'm very excited to have him here today. I appreciate you making the time to come and share with us today. Um, looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us. Also, so you know, I just want to, I'm so happy, okay? So I got to catch up with my words. My brain got to catch up with my words because we've been trying at this thing for probably yes. about a month and a half now. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here and have this opportunity to uh, have this interview. You are welcome. So always I ask my, uh, my guests, tell us about your childhood, Mr. Um, Segada. Well, I was born in one of the smallest towns of Puerto Rico, up in the mountains of Puerto Rico, uh, and um, uh, grew up in, in, in Puerto Rico my first eight years of life. Uh, unfortunately, my father was a victim of gun violence. Uh, he was shot and killed when I was uh, one year old. Uh, my mom uh, worked as a domestic uh, in our city for eight years and after that uh, she entered into another relationship uh, with uh, whom I have five brothers and sisters. Uh, she picked up another couple of kids, foster kids, along the way <laughs> when we moved to New York. Uh, we moved to New York City when I was eight years old um, and uh, that's where most of my brothers and sisters were born. Okay. Uh, so it was a very happy childhood in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. very poor neighborhood, mm -hmm. but um, Folks got along very, very well. Uh, there was a sense of community. There was a sense of everybody looking out after each other's children. And a very high premium was placed on education. So mm -hmm. even though I come uh, from a, a neighborhood growing up that was extremely poor, uh, when I go back to that neighborhood to visit my aunts and uncles who live in that very same neighborhood, uh, most of the kids that were kids along with me are you know school counselors, teachers, lawyers, doctors. So there was a good uh, pathway uh, to opportunity in terms of education in that particular community. Mm -hmm. a, a very high value was placed on, on education. Okay. So how did you land in Hartford? Oh, uh, when I w was in New York, uh, I went there through middle school. Uh, there had traditionally been, been a, a, a very big problem with substance and gang, substance abuse and gangs. Um, I was I was taught by my parents to really be very anti-drugs and also to be uh, not one to join up for gangs. Um, as I got older, 13, 14, uh, the gangs were very aggressively recruiting in the neighborhood. <clears throat> And um, I received many invitations uh, to join. Ili initially, there were invitations. Oh, really? uh, wow. as, as, as I got older, there were pretty much orders that I needed to sign up for gangs. And oh, wow. I was very fearful for my safety because a couple of my friends had been shot, stabbed, some had been killed. Now what I'm part of New York is this? This is the South Bronx. This oh. is the neighborhood that's Ooh. generally referred to as Fort Apache, the Bronx. Oh, okay. It was a very high levels of violence high levels of drug addiction, mm -hmm. and buildings were burning. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many times we had to move uh, during 1972, 73, mm -hmm. 74. Uh, when things reached a critical stage that I knew that I was risking my life if I didn't leave there, mm -hmm. obviously my mom at that point had uh, five very young kids, mm -hmm. so it's not like we can all move. Uh, you felt sort of trapped. I was always an adventurous spirit, um, so I had gotten a number from a person in Hartford. She was a person who was a college professor here in Hartford. This is at what age? Not this 13. is at 14. At 14, 14 I wandered okay. into Central Park. There was an activity. Mm -hmm. There was a, a, an activity honoring uh, our first Puerto Rican to play in the U.S. Okay. major baseball leagues. Okay. And um, I went up snooping around what was going on, and I met this woman. She was in her 60s. Mm -hmm. She was an assistant professor at Capital Community College, wow. which was then Greater Hartford. Okay. And when she, I asked her if she was famous, because they were giving them awards, she says, no. My <laughs> brother was famous. He was the first Puerto Rican to play in the major leagues. Mm -hmm. And I says, well, I thought you were famous. What, what do you do? She says, I'm a college professor. Mm -hmm. And I says, college professor? I want to go to college. Wow. So okay. she wrote her number on a little paper bag, and that's, that was my connection to Hartford. Okay. Um, at 15, I basically ran away from home. 
uh, with my mom's sort of partial blessing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've given that, that a few times. <laughs> at, that, at that point, I was working in a supermarket. I had been working there for two, two, two plus years. I had been working there. Mm -hmm. Started as a t stock clerk, a grocery delivery boy, moved on to a cashier, mm -hmm. and uh, picked up more responsibility along the way. So I gathered my two last paychecks and ventured off to Hartford. Mm -hmm. It was either Hartford or Minneapolis, Minnesota. Wow. But when I went to the train station, uh, I found out the fares that were too expensive. Went over to the bus station, and still the, the fare to Minnesota was $44. The well, fare to Hartford. Our mayor was a hobo. He was the, jumping. <laughs> uh, you know, the, 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 the woman at the bus station, I said, how much is the ticket to Minneapolis? She says it's $44. Mm -hmm. I said, how much is the ticket to Hartford? She says, it's $4.50. I says, I'll go what? to Hartford. <laughs> and she said, young man, I could still recall her looking over her glasses, saying, young man, do you know where you're going to? I, says, I have to go to both places, but I'll go to Hartford first. For, oh, I didn't wow. make it to Minneapolis until recently. Okay. First time I was in Minneapolis so for a conference. So obviously had some connections here in Hartford. Then. No connections. No, Except for this No woman. family, no friend. As a matter of fact, when I came to the city, the woman wasn't even in Hartford. She was in Waterbury. And her phone was disconnected, so I didn't catch up with her. So with a lot of luck... And, and God's uh, oh, uh, protection God and some guardian angels. Um, but it was a different Hartford. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I felt very safe. I felt people were very, very friendly. Mm -hmm. And within a week's time, I was in a CETA program for an EMT training. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why I want to work towards a building a city mm -hmm. where there's opportunities for any young man or woman out there mm -hmm. that wants to progress. Mm -hmm. So within a week's time, I was earning some money, getting some training, and, and it's history from there. Okay, great. Um, so my um, third question is around you being mayor. I believe when I first started um, paying attention to City Hall, it was at the end of um, Perez's t yes. um, term, and you were coming in. I wasn't even aware that you were on City Council, actually, at that time, but that, you know, you were... Um, you had taken the mayor's seat because of that. So from my understanding, it wasn't in your plans at that time, but did you ever consider at some point possibly being, because you were council president. Yes, yes. So um, usually is it the order of things that next is, you know, maybe well, to aspire to mayor? I, at Capital Community College, I studied political science. Public administration was sort of my major. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the University of Hartford Mm -hmm. and studied political science. Okay. So politics and, and, and things having to do with politics and government uh, were in my agenda very early on. In terms of running as a candidate, that was very far okay. from my mindset. I like to study everything from the outside, mm -hmm. comparative politics, government, uh, intergovernmental relations, all that sort of stuff, but never want to think of myself as a candidate. In, in fact, it wasn't until I nearly got my AARP card <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that I went into council, and the way that happened was is I, I go in to fill a vacancy. I was appointed okay. by council, mm -hmm. and I, I, my intentions were only to do it for the 18 months that were remaining in the term. Okay. But then I I said, you know, this is a, yeah, I was starting to have some impact, okay. and um, I was I got used to the role. It says you know, I'll run for a four year term, mm -hmm. and it was halfway through that term when I was serving as council president that our former mayor resigned, and I ele was elevated to position of of, of mayor. Mm -hmm. It happened very quickly. Now, having said that, I wasn't new to City Hall. Mm -hmm. I was the city attorney for, I think, four or five years. Okay. When I was very young, I was a early 30s. Mm -hmm. um, I graduated from law school very young, uh, and I, I have a master's in social work. Mm -hmm. But no, 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 no idea that I would become mayor, no, no plan. I'm going to be mayor. Let me get on this path. Okay. Um, but I'm very happy to be mayor. I love this job. Mm -hmm. I love the the, the ability that you have to make impact mm -hmm. and, and change things for the better. Mm -hmm. So I work very hard at it, and um, I, think, I think we're setting a new course for the city. And okay. So I'm glad you're here again because, you know, I, I, I tickle myself because you are, are very helpful with the work that the Daughters of Eve do yes. as far as advocating in, in civic engagement. You've been um, really... Um, we appreciate your support in those areas, but I say, you know what? You know, before I kind of like I, I didn't vote for you. I voted for Stan McCauley. <laughs> <laughs> Stan's a great guy. Stan's a great guy. <laughs> I would have voted for him myself if I wasn't running if in wasn't the election. <laughs> 
Okay, so tell me, um, your Honorable Mayor, please, what's the toughest part of your job? The decision making, you know, uh, there's a lot of critical decisions that need to be made. Um, a lot of them are, most of the decisions I, I make that are within the mayor's purview, you still need to reach out oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you don't have uh, the, the luxury of time mm -hmm. to have all of the meetings to get the consensus. Mm -hmm. So I, I like consensus building, I like collaboration. I Just as you mentioned, Daughters of Eve, you have some neighborhood projects mm -hmm. that are critical to our city and important, uh, we don't have the funding in place to do all the things that we would like to do. So it requires a really good collaborative relationship with neighborhood groups, volunteer groups, to get things done. It's called collaborative impact, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and when it comes to the decision making, there's just a lot of decisions that need to be made. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, the, the real challenge. You know, the financing of our city, it's a real challenge because obviously uh, we're locked into a tax system that basically provides the real estate tax as the basically the, the major source is not the sole source. I'm we sorry, I missed the word. The what tax? The the, the real estate tax. Real estate uh, tax. All of the revenue that's obtained in our city, the most part, uh, is obtained through taxing our properties, mm -hmm. and 52 percent of our properties are tax exempt. Mm -hmm. So that cuts yeah. off 52 percent mm -hmm. of our of our of our of our taxes that we could potentially get. There's a state pilot, a payment in, in lieu of taxes that's supposed to replace that money. But that's always funded at a very minimal level. Mm -hmm. So we're still sort of short change and it creates a real problem for us because the mill rate is very high. I've stabilized it. During the four years that I've been mayor, we've not seen any any significant increase in taxes. Mm -hmm. Any adjustment has been just to, 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 to balance things out. But taxes for the residential properties have not basically gone up during the four years that I've been mayor. Um, but it, it comes at a cost. Every year we go through a budgeting process that we have to cut back and cut back in order not to raise taxes. So my goal in, in, in the near future is to do things in our city that will expand the tax base. And that's what efforts like Downtown North are about, mm -hmm. taking that sea of parking lots, mm -hmm. putting it to productive use that will give us back more taxes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for, for about 30, 40 years, people have been trying to do that without success. I think we have a good plan in place to get that moving forward, that we could get the advantage of the additional uh, revenues. Um, it's, it's a very comprehensive plan that involves retail, housing, a baseball stadium, supermarkets, um, uh, and, and, and most importantly, connecting the north end to our downtown. That sea of parking lot serves as a buffer that distances the north end from our downtown. And then in addition, you have 84, which is basically blocked off the north end. So this is about reconnecting our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. This is about increasing tax revenue mm -hmm. to our city. This is about getting a supermarket. This is about having more amenities, a stadium, which is serving as a conduit to attract development. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until we mentioned plans for the stadium that the Bank of America building mm -hmm. uh, over there that was on the market for about six, seven years mm -hmm. actually got an offer. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until we announced that, that we have some businesses wanting to come in, the Hooker Brewery and others, mm -hmm. supermarkets that want to come in. And this is something that's been done in about, at least that I visited, uh, about 10 or 12 cities where stadiums have been used to create more vibrancy, mm -hmm. to create more jobs, to create more economic development. But it's not just about a stadium. The stadium is the magnet. It's a spark. It's a conduit. Mm -hmm. It's about downtown north development converting that sea of parking lots into viable businesses that bring in jobs. Our city is growing. You know, Yukon is coming to town. Front Street is almost finished. Uh, we have about 1,200 units of housing that we're building in collaboration with CERTA and the state. The, the, the state provided about 70, 60 million dollars worth of funding to spark some housing development. We have some initiatives of our own that we're doing, working with the Hartford Housing Authority, uh, the redevelopment of Nelton Court, um, coal spill, uh, 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 Cape Well, which is, these are two old historic buildings that we're now getting to the point of, of really re-enlivening our city. So um, what do you think about your opponents? You, you, you give a good um, um, stance for why we should have this for our city and 
to be honest, for all of those of you who will be upset with me, because some of you are not going to like me anyway, so it doesn't matter. I'm looking forward to the stadium to come. But um, you have some opponents out I, there. You know, I, in part, I would even, you know, there, there's a very small group that they're opponents, and they will oppose anything that I It looks really would, big in City Hall, though, when you fill no, up a room. No, no, no. I mean, I've, I, look, I've spoken to hundreds and thousands. Actually, at this point, over a thousand people, mm -hmm. and and the overwhelming majority are in favor of the stadium and downtown North development. You know, once they have an opportunity to understand it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I think. But you know, I, I think the opposition, to the extent there's been opposition beyond the typical group of 20, 30 people that that, that are opposed to any development there, um, that that it's enabled the process to become better. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily mind when people have different points of view because if they're willing to engage me in dialogue and I'm and we can and we can have that sort of uh, conversation it, it only makes things better because I'm able to sometimes appreciate things that perhaps maybe I didn't think about that need to be incorporated so this has become through the process a much better plan by getting the input um, one of the inputs that we got was that a, a supermarket is very important to this development, so we made sure that we incorporated that into the request for proposals. One of the things that people were very clear on is they didn't want this to increase their taxes. So although we initially presented it as a $60 million project with sources of revenue that would pay you off that $60 million worth of bonds, we, we realized that, look, if this is about downtown north development, let's include it into a whole total development for the whole neighborhood, for the whole, create a, a brand new neighborhood, yeah. and let's have the project and the private investment take care of figuring out the ways of, of the revenue streams to pay that so we don't have to do it by way of bonding. Mm -hmm. So we've learned some things, we've incorporated some of that thinking. The thinking that, that I oppose is that doing nothing could be an option, <laughs> and that having no development there and just yeah. letting those parcels sit and spend money towards social services and education, we're doing that. We've spent over a billion dollars building schools in the, since 2000. Uh, we, we have probably the, the biggest proliferation of social programs in, 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 in the, in, of any city in, in the state. And that's not to say or minimize that we don't need more. We constantly need more help. Mm -hmm. But my funding more social programs doesn't bring me revenues. I have to think of a way that I can bring in additional revenues so that we can use that money to sustain our operations, reinvest in our city, and provide the services that we need. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to come back on the topic of the stadium in a minute, but we're going to take a break here right now. Don't forget to stay tuned. We're coming right back. Don't leave your seat. Maybe run to the bathroom or something. But thank you for watching For the Greater Good with Evelyn Richardson with our special guest, Mayor Pedro Sagada.
Thank you. Welcome back to For the Greater Good with Evelyn Richardson and my special guest, Honorable Mayor Pedro Segarra. So when we finished off, we were talking um, about the stadium and and I know that the RFPs went out. I've been hearing on the news. Sometimes I would rather hear it from the horse's mouth because the news, you know, you, you never know where they might throw in something sideways. So. Can you share with us some of the RFPs that have come across the table that you all are considering? Yeah, there's, there's, you know, the request went out and we basically told potential bidders, we have these lots that have been assembled. Um, this is an ongo a continuation of a redevelopment plan that to some measure predates me. Mm -hmm. So we have had something called One City, One Plan. Mm -hmm. We've had a redevelopment plan um, and uh, with that redevelopment plan, part of the strategy was to make sure that if we wanted to get a developer to develop a particular, let's say a block, mm -hmm. that we would have control of all the parcels because there was different parcels. Right. And you, you, you're you not gonna get a developer to come in and say, okay, well we own uh, lot one, lot three, <coughs> and lot seven, but you have to go out and you have to negotiate the purchase of the other, the developers are not interested. Mm -hmm. So we finally got to the point where we were able to assemble these parcels and then go out for a request. We had hired some consultants that advised us, um, you know, what, what are the things that can go there that will really generate jobs, activity, et cetera. And they provided uh, very good information about so many apartments, so much retail, so much office space. And all this is done, of course, with the hopes and the aspirations that we would increase, increase the job space, increase uh, taxes coming into our city. Um, as it relates, to this particular downtown north development, we're trying to create basically a new neighborhood that connects our downtown and our north end. Um, for too long, these neighborhoods have been separated. It, it's, it, it contributes towards the alienation of a community. Uh, economically, it doesn't benefit uh, the community. So as we, as we accelerated the implementation of Albany Avenue streetscape, which we're implementing in a way that benefits communities to the north and to the south of the avenue mm -hmm. so that it's not just a quick way to get in and out of the city. Right. It requires a lot of thinking, a lot of planning, how you're going to deploy that project. One of the things that commonly uh, came back to us, whether it was in my participations on the Mayor's Institute of Design, which we had in South Carolina, Carolina, Mayor Riley leads that, or the Rose Fellowships, which is uh, something that's held at the Urban Land Institute. It was very okay. prestigious. We were selected uh, one of five cities chosen from over 600 cities that apply. Yeah, uh, it became very apparent that if we really wanted to uh, take full advantage of the Albany Street project and connect those neighborhoods to the downtown, that we also needed to accelerate the development of downtown north. So in our proposal, it calls for housing, retail, the stadium, supermarkets, and any other proposals that will make this a very vibrant place that adds to vibrancy and our economic base. So we got four responses. Three of those responses qualified in terms of meeting the requirements of what's called the request for proposals. And of those three, now comes the process of vetting them. Uh, at least two of the proposals do have the, 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 a lot of the different elements. So now they're, they're, they're being, they will be vetted and we will come back to council with a recommendation in terms of which, which one we think is the best one. Council will then have an opportunity to vet that proposal themselves uh, and, and they'll vote on it. And uh, if they vote on it successfully, uh, then we will continue with development. If not, then we'll back to the sort of drawing board. Drawing board, wow. Okay, so you talked about the um, supermarket. So there's, I heard someone say that, you know, it's impossible to have a supermarket near a stadium. And how do you feel about that? You no, know, there's, there's other cities, other models. Washington, D.C. with national stadiums. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, you know, other I thought so. I couldn't other, put other cities, you know, um, you know, the, 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 you know there, there will be times in which there will be uh, thousands of people at the stadium. So the question becomes, does that benefit or not benefit the, the supermarket? You know, uh, I assume that in some families, maybe mom or dad don't like baseball and they'll go <laughs> grocery shopping instead. I, I don't know, but, but we did do the, the, the study in terms of um, how many customers would be needed for a supermarket mm -hmm. if it was put there and whether the region will support that. And the research shows very well 
that if we put a supermarket of, mm -hmm. of a certain size, I believe it's the range of uh, 30 to 50,000 square feet, I think mm -hmm. is the size, that there is enough population, not just from Hartford, but from East Hartford and surrounding communities that will be able to utilize that market. It's very important, it's a food desert, mm -hmm. um, and we need to provide access to food to, to the neighborhoods. Okay. But but the whole thing is not incongruent. And then let me just go back another sure. uh, another thing that that this has moved from a publicly financed bonded stadium proposal to a more comprehensive neighborhood development public private partnership in which the private sector comes in, puts the money to do the buildings, and then through the different streams of revenue they get their payments to support the payments on the development. And through the same process, we get taxes as a city to fund our operations. That is the model. Because I keep on still hearing the sixty million. It's I like, know, me too. That 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 has been so out of the picture since like several days when Council President and I had the conversation even prior to the um, proposal being brought to the public. Council President did have concerns about you know we need to get some private funding for this. And I says okay, well in the resolution we will put in we will identify sources of funding or alternate models of financing. Mm -hmm. That was all up in the initial resolution. It sort of like got lost in the conversation. Mm -hmm. But I think that days after that, we made it very clear. RFP, private-public partnership. Okay, so that um, a great um, start for me to ask this question because I heard someone sharing with me that, uh-oh, we might have, you know, cut off our, our nose despite our face with um, asking for the private money. Does that cut out some of the small business opportunity, say, to get like such a certain percentage of Hartford workers in. If it's private money that's taking care of it, does it, we lose any? Um, the, it's built into the proposal. The request for proposal says if you, if you apply for this project to be the developer, you will have to comply with our local minority hiring okay. ordinances that are in place. In fact, we want to be aggressive and, 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 and hope to exceed that. That's one piece. The other thing in terms of the small businesses, uh, my director of, uh, of, of development services and our economic development folks have been tasked by yours truly that this is meant to augment and increase participation in our community businesses. So there are businesses that are close by, selling shoes, uh, there's a hairstylist around there, there's different businesses, and nothing that happens with this project should displace them. In fact, the reason why we're doing this is to strengthen our community, so the end result needs to be that those businesses are strengthened as a result. So we, we need to make sure that those folks are on board, make sure that we don't do anything that displaces them, because there are some concerns there. Of course. This should strengthen those businesses by bringing more vibrancy and more customers to the area. Okay, so um, put on a little of my half of NRZ hat to, to ask this question. We know that what's called downtown North now is it's not a part of a, um, a, a zone. It's not a NRZ zone. It's not a part of Clay Arsenal, definitely not a part of Northeast, and it's not um, zoned in with downtown. Will it re receive a, a zone um, as a result of it if it becomes um, a, the yeah. project takes I, place. I have been very careful mm -hmm. that if the purpose of establishing this development downtown north is to strengthen and empower the north and communities. Mm -hmm. We have had clear dialogue with B. Powell and the other leaders of the NRZs mm -hmm. to make sure that they are connected, informed as to what is going on, mm -hmm. and that this does not replace them or displace them as a community, but that this actually strengthens those communities. Mm -hmm. So the way I see it, although I don't make the final decisions, is that this is to be integrated into those NRCs. There's also a downtown sort of business interest as well. So they need to be, you know, sort of integrated to coordinate the economic development. But we just need to get neighborhoods working together for the benefit of those neighborhoods. That's what this is about. Okay. So um, before we run out of time, we have about five minutes more. So tell me about any thoughts on our last primary? I'm a Democrat. <laughs> we have a democratic process. Mm -hmm. And that process is to have uh, voters come out and express their will mm -hmm. um, and as a Democrat I join my fellow Democrats in striving to work together mm -hmm. we have some critical issues in our community mm -hmm. 
once the election is over and the people have spoken, it is incumbent upon those folks mm -hmm. to work together right. to translate the community's will mm -hmm. into action plans and work That's plans. Right. So I look forward to working with all those who are victorious in these elections mm -hmm. to move our city forward. There you go. I agree. Any other thoughts? Would you like to share something with our viewers? You have a few minutes to you do You know, so. the city of Hartford is a beautiful city. It's a city that I love. It's a city that has given me incredible opportunities. I want to make sure that our youth have access to those opportunities. The economy has very, been very, very slow in recovering, uh, but that's not an excuse not to move forward. Even in spite of difficult times over the five, past five years, we have been able to weather the storm. My priorities are our children and the education of our children. I want to make sure that we have a very aggressive early education agenda, especially for our three to five year olds. 80% of brain development happens when kids are in that range of zero to five. We need to tap into the resource, make sure that we're doing so that we can build healthy, strong children that will succeed. Following that, making sure that we have a seamless transition to kindergarten and that K to three are good, solid, structured programs, that we fortify our community schools, that we work with our new superintendent to make sure that parents are engaged and a part of the education of our children, mm -hmm. and that we build the wraparound services because we have many families that are living in poverty. Mm -hmm. And that is a big challenge. Having said that, I will continue to work with the other mayors uh, through the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, last week, I was at New York City with Mayor de Blasio, Mayor Watch from Boston, mm -hmm. on an effort that we're launching that is called Cities of Opportunities to address the income inequality that exists in our countries. Mm -hmm. Graduation rates in our community are going up. Uh, we have uh, a, a, lot of econo um, a lot of economic activity that's going on, yet people are still falling more and more into poverty. Mm -hmm. So the only re way that we are going to be resolving that is by making sure that we do the things that we need to do uh, to, to empower our communities. You know, sometimes it's things like broadband access. 80% mm -hmm. of the jobs that we apply for are on the internet. Exactly. Yet our community doesn't have full access to the internet. Mm -hmm. Our libraries are doing a good job mm -hmm. in terms of providing access, but we still need to empower uh, our communities to have access to the internet and know how to use the internet exactly. to their advantage to access services, goods, jobs, educational opportunities. And then the other piece of our efforts as, as, as Cities of Opportunity is to strengthen our early education program and address the minimum wage issue, which our governor has been on board and which Connecticut is on board because we need to, you know, I agree with our president and our, and our governor. If there's no reason why a family who works 40 hours a week and works hard doing it should have to live in poverty. We need to make sure that our community is lifted. I agree. So those are some of the issues. And, you know, of course, you know, capital city. Hartford is the capital city. So we need to act, look, and feel more like the capital city. That gives exactly. us an important opportunity. I forgot. I have one more thing. In, in April, on April 4th of 2005, I was watching television with my children and cartoons. Have you ever watched cartoons? Yes. It was a show called Jimmy Neutron. Are you familiar yes. with him? Yes. And he made this statement, and I thought it was so profound at that time. I was just really getting really strong into community work. And he said, he, he was speaking to one of the other characters. He said, people are supposed to be flawed. When they have flaws, it shows that they are working perfectly. With your um, social, service, um, social services hat, um, can you elaborate on that for me? We're not perfect. We have a lot of <laughs> challenges as a community, but it's important to keep the dialogue going because mm -hmm. if we communicate with one another, we can start working on some of those flaws that get into our survivability That's and right. our viability. So the more dialogue that we have, the more we're in communication with each other, the more we reach out to the public to keep them informed, the more there is the potential to acknowledge that we're not perfect, mm -hmm. but that we're not creating further imperfections by sort of not, not talking to each other. Exactly. Dialogue is important. Exactly. So the mayor has just made it into my, my book that I'm going to be leaving for my children when God takes me away from this place, A Mother's Legacy. Yes. So thank you for being thank here. You. you made it into my book. And I'm not finished with you yet, so you got to give me a meeting because I have some more questions to ask the mayor. Thank you for joining us today on For the Greater Good. Thank you again, Mayor Thank Sagana. you so much for having me. <laughs>